Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Jones College of Business Lifelong Learning Series. My name is David Urban. I'm Dean of the Jennings A. Jones College of Business at Middle Tennessee State University. Today, our speaker is innovation leader Nate Souter. Nate is the Associate Vice President, Ecosystem Innovation Manager for Fifth Third Bank in Dayton, Ohio. He positions Fifth Third as a collaborative leader by working with universities, startups, and large companies to achieve advancement in innovation and research. At Centrifuge in Cincinnati, Ohio, Nate contributes to the work being done at fintechfrontier.com and is an executive in residence, among other things which I'm sure he will tell you about. Let's welcome Nate. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Dean Urban, for having me. Thank you all for showing up. Um, it really does mean a lot to have people in the audience, right? Um, it's, a, it's an interesting title to a talk. Stop brainstorming and start innovating. Um, it's one that will cause all of us to come in with an idea of what that means. Um, but I like the topic because we've all been in a brainstorm at, at some point, some time or another, right? And, and there's, a, there's an essence in a brainstorm that it carries, and it's that there are no wrong answers, right? Let's think outside the box, and we're going to dive in. Um, but before I get started, you know, there's, there's a couple things that are, that are true. One is um, I listen to a lot of talks. I listen, uh, you know, whether I go to conferences or listen to them online, um, I, I always like coming away from the talks with something that I can use immediately rather than not be like, okay, well, that was, you know, the person was obviously a good speaker, but like, what am I supposed to take away from that? So the goal for me today is to give you one thing that you can apply, whether it's, you know, in your um, uh, next group project or, or professional work that you're doing, whether it's in your household or with roommates or anyone else, um, that, that, you, that you can apply and be a better you. All right, to, to start out with, uh, there, there's a point here, right? Believe it or not, creativity is not innovation. There's, there's a couple of things that are, that are fascinating here, and it's that, um, uh, what am I trying to say? So with, with innovation in a big co, we've spent a lot of time and effort bringing creativity back into the workplace. So you all have heard like design thinking or um, out of the box thinking and brainstorming. We spend a ton of time and effort and money bringing it back into, the, into our companies. But the problem is we're calling it innovation and it's not because oftentimes our ideas just aren't possible. Right? And that's the big thing to take away is think about the last brainstorms that you were in and think if what came out of the brainstorm got you any further down the road. That's what I'm gonna show us how to do today. But first, uh, one thing that I really like to talk about, I have a five-year-old in the house, so whether or not you have uh, little ones in your households or, or um, in your kind of extended family, I like to talk about how kids approach creativity because they come with it out of the box, right? Like I've never, I've never taught my daughter how to be creative. I teach her how to be functional. And we, we start to reward our kids um, or those in our households for being very functional, right? Tie your shoes, eat your dinner, th things like this. So we lose our creativity over time. If you want to talk about something, though, that's really creative in our household, I feel like we could support the individuals that make this show on their own. Anyone familiar with Bluey, right? If you want to talk about, as a parent, feeling like you are, you are not creative enough, um, the, the parents in this, in this show are, are fascinating in their level of creativity. On the, on the flip side of this, though, is another show that I really like it uh, when it's on in our household. Um, and that's a show called Ada Twist Scientist. Anyone heard of this? Anyone? Possibly good, thank you. Yeah. What an awesome show. So you have Ada in the middle, who's the scientist. Uh, you have Iggy, the architect, and you have Rosie, the engineer. And in the show, um, they're, they're always met with fun, creative problems, right, that they, that they try to solve as a group. But what I love about, and so in this one, they have, a, they have a cake that they keep baking and it keeps falling, right? And they're trying to figure out why. But what I love about the way they start the show is they, start, they identify their, the problem that they're trying to solve and then they sing a little song, right? It's like brainstorm, brainstorm, and I'm not, not paid for my singing ability. Um, and they start coming up with the most creative ideas. What if, what if aliens swooped down from the sky and, and you know, blasted our cake and magically caused it to rise, right? They think very out of the box through this brainstorming exercise. But when they actually solve their problem, they, actually, they, they start looking at the resources that they have close at hand. That is not out of the box thinking. That's the antithesis of that. That is in the box thinking. 
So the next time you hear, we need to have a brainstorm, we need to think outside of the box, maybe what we should understand is, hey, we have a problem that we've agreed that we need to solve, right? Do we expect it to get us anywhere? Because maybe we're just okay starting to talk about it. It's super cool. The, the first thing that I want you to come away with, and, and whether or not you've been introduced to, to this theory on jobs to be done, um, which it's kind of defined as like understanding the customer journey, right? is I want to introduce jobs to be done as the first half of an equation, which is, which is really cool. So we use this at the bank. I'll go into that a little bit more. Um, is anyone familiar with jobs to be done methodology? Yeah. Awesome. This is exciting. OK. So jobs to be done is super cool. So it's the idea that the job that's laid out over time doesn't change, but the way you uh, accomplish that job does. OK, so I needed to get downtown forever, right? Or I need to get uh, to a different building on the other side of campus. That's, that's never changed. The way that I get there, though, does over time. So it used to be I walked, then I rode a bike, then I took a car, then someone else drives me, and now I can just get on video chat, right? When we think about, when we think about our jobs, though, they can't just be uh, functional tasks. Like, that was kind of task-oriented. When we think about solving things in business or in life, there needs to be an emotional aspect of that, right, for us to be able to um, solve it and also serve our customers along the way. Um, at the bank, At the bank, what's interesting is we have brought back our jobs to be done to three things. We help people get paid, we help them pay others, and we help them manage their money. What's interesting, when we think, so we just launched a new uh, mobile application, right? And when we were trying to decide what features and functions were gonna be part of that app, um, budgeting was, was a thing that came to mind right away. And, and when you think about budgeting, if we were to say, the, um, I want a budget is a job to be done, we had to be really hard on ourselves, right? Because I don't actually want a budget, what do I want? I don't want to run out of money, right? And maybe a budget is like a tool that I can use, but there are plenty of other tools that you can innovate on to help me not run out of money. So when you think about identifying what you do well, try to bring everything back, deduce, it to, deduce everything back to these are the jobs that we help our customers do, right? And these are the tasks that we help them with along the way and make that separation. Everything that I'm gonna talk about today is Take, take everything that exists and make it as real as possible because that gives you a starting point. When someone says, let's think outside the box, there are no wrong answers, like, there have to be wrong answers, right? Like, we have to feed ourselves and feed our kids. All right. So when we talk about uh, the differences in brainstorming and innovation, I'm gonna go through um, a series of terms I'm going to go through a series of terms um, that we need to put out of our mind to be effective innovators. All right, first off, this is one of my favorite, favorite gifs, right? When we think about that, the, the makeup of a brainstorming session sometimes, right? Let's describe the characteristics of it. How many times have you been in a brainstorm with just two people, right? Not very often. Normally, it's five to seven people, and there's always someone checking out that has better things to do or, or whatever, right? And when we, when we facilitate brainstorming sessions online, I don't know if someone's doing their laundry, I don't know if someone's making lunch, I don't know if someone's like highly engaged, they're just a self-described introvert that doesn't really wanna talk, right? How many self-described introverts? For sure. When we think about inclusion in the workplace or in school, is me just knowing that you're an introvert, therefore you're not gonna talk in an inclusive environment, right? The answer is like, absolutely not. Also what we know from experience, is that folks that describe themselves as introverted typically have like better, well thought out ideas, they just don't voice them. It's the person that likes to hear themselves talk saying that, right? <laughs> so how do we give folks a voice? I think that's fascinating. And that's up to a facilitator, that's up to you. When we think about effective problem solving and effective ideation, um, real innovation, smaller groups always, always work out better. I'll go into that a little bit more too. All right, so let's, let's talk about some of the differences. On the brainstorming side, um, it, is, it is total outside the box thinking, right? Um, I was at, uh, I, I had an opportunity to speak to um, our treasury management department. So when you think about like payment services on the back end of websites, right? When you go somewhere and you click check out of things um, with, with your shopping cart, you know, someone handles that money transaction. One of those options is Fifth Third and others, obviously like Stripe and, and different ones. So I had an opportunity to, to speak right after our chief strategy officer. And what was, what was fascinating, um, what was fun about it, I guess, it wasn't fun for me at the time, uh, but he got done with his talk explaining, okay, these are the st strategic directions for the bank, 
Um, and he said, um, it's the year of the product, go out and build the future of the bank, right? So you have, I don't know, 40 product owners, 40 individuals that are in charge of building products for the bank that just heard it's the year of the product, go build the future of the bank. So now I get up there, and well, first off, he introduced me, he's like, Nate, I see you sitting over there, I hope you tank your talk so that I sound better. <laughs> it's like, great way to be introduced. Um, but when I got up there, I was like, okay, so you heard him, let's sit in a big circle, there are no wrong answers. So you're the product, how are you gonna build the future of the bank? And thankfully, like, I got some chuckles. Because that's not, that's not real, right? That's, not, that's easy to say from, from top down, but that doesn't elicit a way to be innovative based on current product. So thinking outside the box, um, design thinking, you're gonna get a lot of folks in the room feeling very comfortable, feeling uncomfortable. So a lot of, um, let's draw things, let's do rapid ideation, let's draw a picture, pass it to someone else, they're gonna add something to it, things like this, right? Um, what's good about it is that participants in the room don't need to be experts on the subject that you're trying to ideate on. That's pretty awesome. So when you think diversity of thought, that's a good thing to have. Now, what's the obvious downfall of that, right? They're not experts in the domain. So if I've been thinking about this for months and I bring in someone else from a completely different department, like, it's hard for me to understand if they're going to be able to contribute more than I would be able to having been in the game for so long. It's a fascinating question. Um, like I said, they're, they're highly interactive activities that build on one another, um, but they, they produce a lot of high-level ideas. And if you've ever facilitated, or in the future, when you facilitate an ideation session, you're going to be left with so many high-level ideas that, you're, number one, you're going to have to de synonymize them, right? Um, because a lot of them are surface ideas. And that's kind of where the, where the work starts, is everyone leaves jazzed, right? Like, oh, this, this is great got some things off my chest for the most part. But the next time you meet up, you really haven't gotten anywhere because the ideas are so high level and they don't account for anything that's already been implemented that's true. That's a problem, right? So when we think about thinking inside the box, I'm gonna go deep on this um, over, over the next period of time. It, it works well with participants who are familiar with the way things currently work. That's really cool because you can take someone who's been knee deep in it, have them follow a process, and come up with better ideation than out of the box thinking. And I'll, I'll show you how to do that. Um, it is more scientific than artsy, but it's kind of the, the all thumbs are fingers, but not all fingers are thumbs conundry, right? Is not all creativity is very innovative because it's not possible, but a lot of very innovative ideas are very creative, right? So there's, it still mixes it. Um, it doesn't require people to be in the same room. You know, when you're drawing things, they need to see it. Um, with, with inside the box thinking, you really don't need to see anything because it's more of us having a conversation uh, and then determining like if we think it's something worth running after, and then we can start to prototype it and do all, do all that kind of stuff. So it's pretty cool. Um, but you get to work solving the real problems right away, which is very different as well. Right? Um, now this is this is the tough part. Um, you have to get past some key challenges, um, and one of those is anchoring. So if you've whew, how, how, do I, how do I describe this? I, I've been in ideation sessions before where a group had already been thinking about the subject for a period of time, and they heard from a stakeholder, we need to think bigger about this, right? We're not solving the full problem. But they already had ideas, and anchoring is just what it sounds like. It's, there, there will be individuals who will anchor themselves to the first piece of information that they hear, and they'll just like stick to it. So it's hard to get folks away from that a lot of times. Um, one, one interesting thing with anchoring, and I, I, I pulled this up as well, is uh, there was a book that was put out by um, uh, Jake Knapp. And, and Jake Knapp was a design partner uh, with Google Ventures. This was a really cool thing five or six years ago to have a, have a person who specialized in design being a partner at a venture capital company. So it was a venture capital company that invests in startups realizing that startups could perform better over time if they paid attention to the customer, which is interesting, right? Like, go figure. But that was a new thing back then. And what Jake did was he wrote a book, he and another person wrote a book called Sprint. And it was like essentially a five-day sprint. And it took into a lot of quick ideation um, techniques. So here's the thing about, ref I'm gonna call it refuting brainstorming, right? And building your, your ideation toolkit is when you, when you focus on, when you focus on high level ideation and you think about real change, a lot of times that's a lot harder than what folks think. There was, a, there was an article that was written and there haven't been a lot of articles written on the subject. There was one in like 2016 that 
essentially said the brainstorming doesn't work, and then a ton of silence, everyone just references that one article. But on February 9th of this year, just a couple weeks ago, this, this was fascinating, right? It's, it's one of those things when you, when you think about something for so long, you're like, I know that there are holes in this, right? I know that it, I'm not getting the results that I want. And then someone finally writes the piece, and you're like, yes, that's what I've been looking for. That's what I haven't, been figure, haven't figured out how to put into words. It was pretty fascinating. But from the MIT Technology Review, I'm going to read this just for consistency's sake. Um, Rebecca Ackerman did uh, a, a series of interviews. And with Jake, this was interesting. Um, and so I'm, I'm just going to read this one paragraph. It says, when Jake Knapp was running those design thinking workshops at Google, he saw that for all the excitement and post-it notes they generated, the brainstorming sessions didn't usually lead to built products, or really, solutions of any kind. Google spent millions of dollars running ideation sessions with these startup companies. For him to look back on his time and say, yeah, it didn't really do anything, is telling. But what, um, what, what it goes on to say is when he followed up with the teams to learn which workshop uh, ideas had made it to production, he heard decisions were still happening in the old way, with a few lone geniuses working separately and then selling their most fully re uh, realized ideas to top stakeholders. Our arguably most creative mind at the bank likes to ideate by himself, which I think is fascinating. He will participate in all, in, in all of the, uh, the um, out-of-the-box thinking workshops, whatever he's asked to do, and he does so purposefully out of ceremony to get other people involved, but he knows that he can't rely on the best ideas coming out from that session. He knows that he needs to go and think, which is really cool. So I'm going to show you how to do that as well. Um, but I think this is super, super interesting. OK, um, I'm going to go into who came up with this term in a second. I want you to focus on the two terms for a second. When you're, when you're coming up with new ideas, a lot of times you have to remove what you believe to already be true, and we call that fixedness. So there are two types of fixedness. There's functional fixedness, which is that's the way we've always done it, right? If it ain't broke, don't fix it mentality. I'm telling you, if, it ain't, if, if someone says, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, go figure out how to fix it and put them out of business, right? Because that's what's going to happen to them anyways. That is prime for we're going to focus on the customer and, and ideate on literally a job to be done, right? And then there's structural fixedness, like the question of you want to take out what? You know, is a refrigerator a refrigerator if it doesn't cool things? Very curious. Right? So as you're going through ideas, as you're coming up in the, in the methodology that I'm going to show you in a second, as you're coming up with ideas that you think facilitate good innovation, you have to constantly remember to remove your own fixedness. And you have to constantly remind the person that you're sitting across from to remove theirs too. And it's like, it's like not easy. All right. All right, so the person that wrote this, uh, his name's Drew Boyd. Um, he wrote a theory called Systematic Inventive Thinking. I'm not going to go straight into this. I, I didn't write the book. He does a ton of stuff on LinkedIn learning. Um, you know, it's one of those when I'm when I'm in the car looking for something to listen to, right? He's just he feels like he's always on doing something, talking about personalities or talking about innovation. But he wrote a book that is conveniently called Inside the Box. Pretty 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 awesome. It's a it's a day read. Um, it's a shorter book with a lot of examples in the back, which is great. So it shows you how to play the game, so to speak. But when you think about methodologies that are currently out there, so I was even talking to someone a couple weeks ago that does a lot in uh, Six Sigma. There are so many tools in Six Sigma that it's, I'm not going to call it overwhelming, but it's a lot, right? In design thinking, goodness, I had a deck of cards. So OK, here's the problem. What problem are you trying to solve? Like, there's like a rules engine that gets you into a game that you're going to play. But there's 40, 50, I, I don't even, there's, there's a ton. Right? So as a facilitator, it takes a lot of training to be able to know which tool to reach for at the right time. Right? Systematic inventive thinking is fascinating because there are, um, there are only five, and I'll get to those in a second. But it assumes that the, the fastest way to innovate is to look at the resources close at hand. Let's go back to the Ada Twist scientist example that I gave. Right? It looks at the resources close at hand. You can't phone a friend. You can't go to the store. You've got to figure out what you have at your disposal to be able to fix your problem. You're stuck on the side of the road. AAA is not a thing. How are you going to change your tire? Right? I'd call, call my friend. Absolutely not. Can't call your friend. Just remove all of that external ideation stuff. How are you going to problem solve with what's in your trunk types? Um, is, is what you want to do with this? Because in, in big businesses and small businesses, when you're trying to solve an ideative problem, you have to look at what's true now to be able to ideate on it. Right? Um, we tend to be surprised with ideas that are right under our nose. How many of us have seen a young company or a startup and you're like, oh, I wish I would have thought of that. Right? It's so easy. Right? If you want to beat, uh, I'm going to use a bad example, but if you want to beat Facebook, you don't recreate Facebook and add more features. 
You take the one feature that's kind of cool about it and you spin it off into its own thing, right? And you have Instagram or something, I don't know. But that, that's, how, that's how you innovate on what other people are messing up on when, when things get too robust. Um, in the startup world, we see this a lot. It's, I, I kind of call it founder syndrome. I don't know if that's like a real term or if there's, there's another, another term for it. But it's the fear of launching because you're always trying to leapfrog someone else, right? Um, it's counterintuitive to a lot of brainstorming methods that use external stimuli um, to get you to think outside of your closed world. So the, the whole goal in systematic inventive thinking is to, to define a closed world too, right? So there's only five methodologies in this. I'm gonna go through three of them today. If we have extra time, I haven't looked at the clock. Oh yeah, we're fine on time, we're great. Um, I can go through a couple more, but it's pretty simple. I'll go through these, but it's subtraction, multiplication, division, task unification, and attribute dependency. The last two are, are big words, but they're actually two of my favorites, and I'm gonna go over those, which is fun. But we'll start with subtraction. So we'll, this, is, this is where I was saying, I'm gonna give you something you can take with you. Um, what subtraction does is it eliminates components of a product or service one at a time, so you can imagine all the remaining components delivering new advantages or benefits. Right? This is like like I said, we're not saying uh, we're the. So let, let's let's actually just jump into an example. We work for Apple. Okay, something like this. Uh, we have an iPhone. Let's say we just became the second best-selling iPhone on the market. So we are no longer number one. Now we're number two. You show up to a manager meeting or something, and they say, okay, no wrong answers, we're number two now. We're gonna sit in a circle, if there are no wrong answers, how are we gonna become number one? I don't know, right? And, but that, that's, what, that's what companies do a lot of times. What we'll end up doing is taking, now this is an older version of an iPhone. So we're gonna start by saying that this is our closed world. Our closed world is this iPhone, simple enough. We're gonna define all the elements that make up this iPhone. So just shout them out, right? I'll give you one of them is the screen. What's another component that makes up this iPhone? Yeah, the camera, what else? The home button, what else? Battery packs, yeah, all the internal stuff, right? We won't, we won't list out all those, what's that? Yeah, yeah, it could be, could be features, right? We'll talk about like kind of what we see. So uh, volume buttons, uh, the toggle on off for the sound, we've got a camera, we have speakers, you listed the rest of them, that's great. So in subtraction, we take components and we eliminate them one at a time to see if it solves a customer benefit. Someone over here said home button. Who said home button? Okay, what's the benefit of removing the home button? Yeah, sure, right? It's a better user experience. Any, engineer, any engineers in the room? What's another benefit of removing the home button? Bigger screen, yeah, what else? Yeah. Yeah, bingo, right? It's one less mechanical thing that can break, is what I hear you saying, right? Okay, so does that solve a customer benefit? The answer is yes. Did they reinvent how a phone works? No. Did they introduce a new phone that innovates on a previous version? Yes. Is it possible? Obviously. Right, that's in the box thinking, not out of the box thinking. All right, the next one is, uh, I came up with my own example for this one. Task unification. It takes a component um, and it assigns it the job of another component, right? So now this component does its original job plus the job of another component. So it forces you to consider non-obvious components to solve problems. All right, that's a lot of words. Here's an example. This is, this is my great-grandmother, don't we look alike, right? Um, who in their family has a family recipe that no one can make better than your family can? Oh yeah, it's a thing, right? Um, this was a published picture in the paper uh, where my great-grandmother was, uh, she made like an a angel food cake, but the, but the secret sauce was the icing. And no matter how anyone tries in our family, they can't make the icing that great-grandma used to make. Like, we all, we all know this. It's change the, change the verbiage and apply it to your own family. So what we're gonna do, once again, is define the closed world. So in this instance, not only is it a thing, it's also a person, right? So what are the things that go into, we'll just take the whole cake as an example, but what are the components of a cake? Yeah, flour, ingredients, what else? Yep, ingredients, what else? Besides ingredients. Yeah, so you're gonna have an oven, right? You're gonna have mixing bowls. What else are you gonna have? Grandma, grandma is great. Grandma is our external component. The pan, yeah, what else? A cooling, yep, for sure, right? You're gonna have a whisk, 
right? Uh, spatulas, <laughs> run it through the kitchen. If you're me, I'm gonna use way more than probably what I need. So what we're gonna do now, I'm not sure if I included this slide or not. Yeah, here we go, perfect. So I have internal components, which you all listed, right? Cake, uh, ingredients, frosting ingredients, mixing bowls, whisks, ovens, cake pans, and a spatula. But then I have an external component, which is grandma. The goal of task unification is to take an, uh, take an internal component, let it do its own thing, but also assign it the job of grandma. So here's my question. What did, what, which one of these does grandma control the most that could have an effect on how my icing is made? Ingre uh, let's say ingredients are written down. Yeah, you all are nailing it. I haven't had a group get it this fast, like first kind of whisk, of course. Yeah, what does grandma know that we don't? How soft the, or how cool the ingredients were, how warm the ingredients were, the RPMs, right, at which she could whip icing. And if you get it wrong, that's the problem with the icing, right? So here's the question, if you assign the whisk its own job to do whiskey things, but also the job of my grandma, you can innovate on a thing, right? By putting an accelerometer in the handle, by putting a temperature gauge in the bottom of the whisk, now we can start to learn. Now, I can't bring grandma, great grandma back, right? But think about, think about um, you've heard of master class? Things like this, right? Like I can take classes from Gordon Rams on how to chop faster or, or whatever it is. What if the utensil, what if he offered a line of utensils with it that had ergonomic indicators on it or something like this to actually teach me how to hold a knife better? or the right temperature for specific ingredients and all the crazy stuff that he makes, right? This is a terrible idea, guys. Like, don't make this. But it shows the ability to, to have an internal component not only do its job, but the job of something else. That's super powerful if you think about cars, right? We have, govern like we have things inside of cars that do its own job plus other things now, which is pretty cool, right? All right, is this all making sense? Let's get a little gut check, all right, sweet. But the point of this is for it to not be rocket science, but something that literally you can pull out of your back pocket immediately and say, because what are we doing in both of these examples so far, right? We're defining exactly what's true, the components that make up our closed world, and we're just messing with it. And there's just five things that we can do to it. We can subtract something, we can multiply something, I haven't gone over that yet. We can divide something out, which is the hardest one to me. We can cause something to do its own job plus the job of something else, or my favorite one's next. And that's attribute dependency. So this takes two attributes of a product and creates a correlation between them. As one attribute changes, another attribute is also required to change. Another tough thing, but uh, a bank is, a, is an institution of processes, right? Um, everything's a, a process. It, it seems like pretty, you know, everywhere now. Um, and processes stink. So think about the last set of forms that you had to sign, right? Like, why do I have to do all of this in the order I have to do it? How many times do you give someone a piece of information? You're like, I've already given this to you five times. Everybody relate? Yeah, we're the problem, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> like, come and help, help us innovate on processes. Um, you know who's most interested at the bank in what I'm talking about? It's not the design folks. Um, a little bit the engineering folks. It's product owners that have to solve problems, central ops, and treasury management. That's totally bizarre to me, but these are the folks that are like, we've been doing things so long this way We've learned so much from what FinTech is coming out and offering. How do we come out and, and uh, ideate and innovate on our current processes? It's, it's super, super cool. All right, back to attribute dependency. So we're gonna take two attributes of a product and create a correlation between them. All right, um, we decided to spend my daughter's college fund on a Disney trip a couple months ago, it's great. It was fun. That's one of the trips that it's like the harder you work, the more fun, fun it is. If you just go in blind, it's gonna be a terrible trip. Right? I saw two fist fights, both in Epcot. One of them was I, kind of sad, like the, the kids were pulling the parents, it was brutal, but fist fights. But these were things that like one person was saying, you should have thought about that before we came. I'm like, you should have, my bride did all this for us. It was wonderful. All right, so we went to, we went to a hotel, um, stayed say at you know, a place um, on property there, but you can think about this in any hotel that you stayed in, right? I stayed at one last night. There's a process uh, of, a, of a hotel check-in, right? Everything from, I just booked my trip, I traveled to Tennessee, I showed up in the parking lot, I loaded my bags on a cart, I walked up to the counter, what did I do? I handed them my ID and a credit card, they handed me a key, they told me directions on how to get to the elevator, I rode up to the third floor, walked down to my room, opened the door, cranked the AC. It's like, it's the same every time, right? See how well I did, that was pretty good. 
Okay, so what this does is we're gonna, you can randomly do it or you can just, you can just play the game and do it all. But what this does is we're gonna randomly take one of these steps, we're gonna yank it out, we're gonna shove it in somewhere else and see if it has a customer benefit. I chose hotels because we've all done it, right? And you're gonna know, you're gonna be like, oh yeah, I stay in a hotel that does this. That's, that's the point, is it's not out of the box thinking, it's in the box thinking. I'm gonna keep saying that over and over and over again. So let's pull something out and insert it back in. Oh, so let's do, so I don't know what my next slide is. So we're gonna say, we're gonna pull out receive room key and we're gonna insert it back in um, before arrive and park. So if I, get, if I get my room key before I get to the hotel, does that solve a customer benefit? What is the benefit? Yeah, I don't even have to go. What do we know about phones now, right? Like I can authenticate and they can know who I am before I even get to the checkout counter, checking counter, sorry. It also does some other things. Oh, there we go, it would've been all right. Receive room key, bump it up. Here's what's cool. To your point, I don't need to go to the checking counter. I don't need to give them my ID and credit card. When I give my ID to anyone, they know things about me that they don't really need to know, right? We talk about identity and security and all the things. Um, and now I can probably like use my phone as the key to get in the room. Here's the other cool thing. As I was running this example, they were like, oh, you know what would be dope is like if they gave me keys to two different rooms and I could go and check them both out and like decide the one that I want because I just stay there. I'm like, oh, that'd be cool, right? So you can start to see how you can innovate just by messing with a current process. Pretty awesome. Okay, this is the third, uh, the third variable. Ooh. I'm moving way ahead on time. So we're gonna have time to run through a couple examples, I think, and, and take some questions. But the third variable that I wanna go over is, is behavior. Um, when you're working in groups, when you're working at a company, if you're working at a big co or a small co or doing things on your own, um, working with other people, it's like pretty challenging, right? I don't have to tell you all that. But here's the thing. People only react to stress in one of three ways and that makes it much easier. All right, if I tell someone something that they don't wanna hear, they're gonna react, like something potentially devastating, right? They're gonna react in one of three ways. They're gonna get angry, they're gonna become fearful, or they're gonna be shameful, react in shame. And if you know that about people in your household, right? So you're, you're thinking about someone, right? When they, when they hear something that they don't like, how do they react? What if you could be for them what they need in that moment versus what you think they need in that moment? So when you think about the ability to remove that fixedness, right? You gotta do that from yourself, but you also have to encourage other people to do it, and some people are more apt to do it than others. I would, I would bet to say that most folks in this room, so I, when I approach a new subject with technology, I put artificial bounds on what I think that technology can do, because I remember a time when technology couldn't solve everything. I'm gonna jump out on a limb and say most folks in this room don't know what technology can't solve. Right? because you've been around it your, your, you know, most of your entire lives. Right? You're gonna approach a topic that we need to innovate on very differently than I do, and I like this stuff. So now put someone in the room, this room that doesn't like this stuff, that thinks that what we're doing is stupid. If you see how they react in things, so like if they've been working on an initiative for years, let's say, right? you get in a job, you're the, the um, early career person that joins a director who's been there for 20 years, and you start shaking trees. Right? You're gonna be completely jacked and then you're gonna be instantly devastated. But if you, see, if you see how they react under that stress in one of those three ways, do they get mad? Do they just become passive? Like, do they pass it off? Do they, are they afraid that they're gonna lose their job? Right? Like, you don't want them to feel that way, right? You can be for them what they need you to be in that moment, which is a really powerful thing in relationship building and allows us to innovate much, much better. Um, if you want more information on that, this is an interesting one. So uh, we've probably heard of DISC assessments or Myers-Briggs, right, personality assessments. I talked earlier about, you know, when you're in a brainstorming session and two people are talking, sharing all of their ideas and no one else can get a word in and I say, well, it's because they're introverts, so clearly they're not gonna talk, right? That's a coping mechanism, right? And that's what Myers-Briggs teaches, right? It teaches us, this is who you are, deal with it, right? What I've been talking about in learning how to be a better you, learning how to serve others better, um, there's, a, there's a study out there um, that you can, you can take if you go to truity.com, but it's on the Enneagram. Anyone familiar with the Enneagram? Yeah, it's like pretty cool, right? Most folks that I know that have heard of the Enneagram, like it, it changes them a little bit because it, it teaches you how to, 
be empathetic. And I think we can all agree that we need a lot more empathy, um, especially when we get into our professional careers. I'm gonna go back and talk a little bit about what I do um, with, with our time. And then if you'd like, I can take you to, through the other two methodologies real quick. Um, but my, my position at Fifth Third, I'm a mighty team of one. Uh, but when you think about what I get to do, it's really working with every other line of business that's at the bank. Um, and my job is to position us um, as a collaborative leader amongst banks and uh, amongst our ecosystem as well. Um, I look at it in this buy, partner, build, research mentality, right? So all of our lines of business across the bank are trying to do things, right? Sometimes they're trying to understand, do we have the talent internally to be able to build this ourselves? Does a young company or vendor exist that we can either partner with or look at as an acquisition target? Or my favorite is when we admit that there's an aspect of it that we don't understand fully. Does a university exist that we could partner with to research it so that when we are ready to tackle it, we're further ahead than when we were uh, when we started, right? Which is really cool. Uh, so that's a lot of what I do. Um, do you guys want to know the other two methodologies? Is that cool if I run through those real quick? All right. So I don't, have, I don't have pictures up, but you're gonna be able to visualize this. Um, so the, the second uh, methodology is um, multiplication, which is super cool. So it multiplicate, and it, run, it runs the same game, right? So what's the, what's the first step in the game, right? Define your closed world. What's number two? List out the elements. Pretty simple. I mean, you guys know the plug in the wall air fresheners? Pretty cool. This is an example out of the book, by the way. So I'm giving you a teaser. Um, way back when, I don't know how many years ago, uh, I, th I think it was P and G. Boy, I'm gonna I'm gonna say company name, companies' names, and someone's gonna look this up and be like, he didn't know what he was talking about. And clearly, I don't. But <laughs> plug in the wall air fresheners. A company was in uh, a distant second place. They were trying to figure out how to be first. They're also the company that make Febreze, right? So they they got in a room, and they said, we are a distant second. Our job is to become first. Figure it out. Also, you have to use Febreze. And they're like, cool. Just put Febreze in a little oil tube and ship it, right? Like, not good enough. So what they ended up doing, right? So let's break it down. Um, what are the elements that make up a plug in the wall air freshener? The, the fragrance. What else? The warmer, yep, what else? The plug, yeah, there's typically something decorative on it as well, sure, awesome. What multiplication does is it takes one of those elements and it duplicates it, but then you have to change it in a meaningful way. All right, so long story short, if you take that oil pod and you duplicate it, and you change it in a meaningful way, it causes scent confusion in people's houses. So have you seen the dual action plug in the wall air fresheners where it's like two different scents? People get used to a smell. What they realize is in the morning you can make things smell fresh and clean, and in the evening you can make it smell, I don't know, like fall or something like this, right? They went from a distant second to first, you know, pretty, pretty quickly because of that. That is, that, is, that is not out of the box thinking. I don't know how long it would take them to come up with that idea versus breaking something down to its basic core elements and building it back up from there. It's pretty cool. Um, and then the last one is division. Division is tough. Um, think about, and like I said, this is, this is one that I'm still learning, right? Practice makes perfect with some of these things. And um, I'm nothing if not a practitioner, and I, I like to go in and even help other groups practice. It's like, let's play the game on something. So division, uh, let's, let's, let's take a refrigerator. That's, I, th I think that's the example in the book. What are the elements of a refrigerator? The cooler, the coolant, yeah. What else? The doors, yeah. Just obvious stuff, guys. Ice maker. Yeah, the lights. Very good. Huh? Yeah, the drawers, drawers, doors, all the, all the things there. Right? Bunch of stuff. All right. So uh, someone said coolant. We'll call that the. So the story in the book is they go to GE. This is where I talk about having a diverse group of individuals talk about a subject and having the experts talk about it. Sometimes experts get like a little protective of their baby. And this was one of those examples. You have folks that have thought about a refrigerator every way inside and out, right? And now you're telling them we're gonna innovate on your baby. That's, that's like not cool in, in a lot of places. Uh, so when, when they asked them, okay, which one of those elements do you wanna mess with? Do you wanna divide out? Um, and that's what division does, is it takes an element and it divides it either physically or functional, functionally away from the core unit itself, right? The guy in the room's like, clearly the compressor. And this was my question earlier, right? If a refrigerator's not a refrigerator, is it still a refrigerator, right? So that, that's what they ended up doing. Like, okay, okay, let's play the game. In this case, they said, let's take out the compressor. Where is a compressor? So the, they started asking, what are the benefits of removing it? 
Where is a compressor generally located in a refrigerator? In the back? At the bottom? What happens when a refrigerator gets older? It starts to get loud. I have a loud refrigerator. Anyone else have a loud refrigerator? It's annoying, right? So if I need to work on it, I've got to pull the whole thing out. I've got to get to it back there. Okay. So what they ended up doing was saying, okay, that those, what is a benefit of removing the compressor? It's quieter, potentially easier to work on. If you've been in, um, for me, it's like if I've toured it, obviously, uh, a custom home, sometimes now they have the main refrigerator unit, and then they also have like drawers that are also refrigerators. They don't have their own individual compressors. They're all running off of a main central compressor. So it allowed them to rethink grocery organization across the house based on how users use things. Super cool, right? All right. Those are the five examples. Um, I, I hope that that was helpful, right? If, if you walk away from anything, it's do we know what we do? That's jobs to be done, right? So at the bank, once again, as we help people get paid, pay others, manage their money, it needs to have an emotional aspect to it for it to be a real job that you can innovate on because that has customer value, right? We talked about removing fixedness, which is a Drew Boyd methodology. Look up inside the box by Drew Boyd. Um, It'll, it'll, it'll help you be a better person all, all around by reading that book and, and understanding how things work. Because when you see innovation happen, you'll be like, that's what they did. I know what they did. Right? They use multiplication on that. It's pretty cool. Um, we, so we talked about the two forms of fixedness. Right? We talked about anchoring. That was a big deal. The first piece of information a person gets is typically what they cling to. It's fascinating stuff. And then we talked about the five methodologies of systematic inventive thinking. Right? Subtraction, multiplication, division, task unification, and attribute dependency. Think about a process. Th think about, um, oh goodness, I don't know. The, like the next, the next thing that you have to go through that is process oriented, whether it's at school or home or applying for rent somewhere, I don't care what it is. Break down the steps of it, like just list them out. This is what I have to do. And just start messing with it and see what happens. It'll be really cool. You'll come up with your own startup and tell me about it. Um, that's all I have. Thank you for, once again for having me. I'd be happy to answer questions. I know we have mics up front, um, if you have any questions at all. I'm gonna get a drink while you all decide. Um, don't. <laughs> of course, yeah. The the question uh, from Dean Urban was, if I could give advice, for, I don't know if that, that I'm the right person to give. I can give guidance, maybe not advice. Advice is like you need to change something about yourself. Right? <laughs> guidance is, have you thought of? Um, what what advice uh, advice or guidance can you give uh, a young professional going out into the workforce that maybe I wish that I would have known? Is that fair? Um, it's that don't get discouraged by your ideas not coming to fruition. Try to understand what other people that are part of the organization, like what's important to them, and it'll make it make way more sense. In innovation, um, in startups, so much code that we wrote never got pushed to production. And I can get mad about it, or I can learn from it. And the times that we chose to learn from it, we made leaps in our understanding of how business works, right? Um, what's important to stakeholders. You know what's fascinating? We did, uh, we introduced, this, this is a good example. We introduced at Fifth Third um, uh, two day early pay, right? So you get a paycheck, you normally get paid on Friday. We'll actually give your money two days early. Pretty, pretty cool feature, right? When we started um, researching the subject way back when, we actually found out that people didn't really care about that. It was, yeah, you're just like accelerating my problems two days early, or like, why do I need my money to, like it was a fascinating study. But what we learned that was important to our executives was that to be able to get your paycheck two days early, you had to have your paycheck coming to Fifth Third, and that meant that we were their primary bank. We, if we would have just said, the research is the research, our executives clearly don't care about the research. It's like, no, the executives thought that something was more important than the one thing that we were judging it by. That made all of us start to understand the next problem that they tasked us with to say, okay, we need to put ourselves in this person's shoes, right? Let's list out what's true for them. They sit on earnings calls. They have to manage umpteen departments. 
I am like, I am like one little thing that people know, barely know my name, right? If they're tasking me with something, how do I put myself in their shoes to be better for them, once again, under stress, right? I can't imagine what our executives have to go through on a weekly, monthly basis. I put myself in their shoes and help problem solve for them. That is my biggest thing, is find out what other folks are stressed with and have their back. It's pretty awesome. Any other questions? Yeah, please. Yeah, innovation has a time element to it. How yeah. do you uh, allow employees the time that they need to be innovative in their thought and, yeah. and bring forth process? <laughs> That's a really good question. So what I even think about is the innovation process itself. Um, you know, we like to limit everything to two minutes. I don't know who got two minutes. Um, and and the, qu the question was, um, the, the innovation process itself, how do we encourage folks at the bank um, based on a time constraint? How do you allow them the time? How, how do we allow them the time to innovate? Um, you know, we have been the, the, the empire of the six to eight month expedition. And for us, we've been allowing too much time. Um, you know, when we go into a brainstorming session or some of these quick ideation things, we only give two minutes per exercise. And whether General Patton said it or not, if we're all thinking the same, then none of us is really thinking very hard, we end up getting a lot of ideas that are exactly the same, right? Um, so I think, to, to answer your question, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be hard on myself on the question because I think it's a really good one, is I think that in big business, just like what Jake Knapp said earlier, so many ideas still come from the top because we're not going about it correctly. When we sit and research a topic into the ground, it causes us to circle and circle and circle and not implement, right? Or even show a proof of concept. I've seen enough trouble just showing proof, of, like showing that we can, not that we should. It's a big deal in innovation, right? If you turn me into another squad, then I'm just gonna be another squad, right? And I can't focus on, on, on newer things. Um, but even what Jake said, when you, when you don't go about innovation or ideative thought the right way, you can, you can circle around a topic for plenty of time, but what you actually implement is gonna come from the top of house. What I've been allowed to do, and you see it here, is do a straight bottom up build, right? I'm going to engage to mess around and see what comes out of it. Um, and, and innovation comes through that because, because you're able to, number one, operate on an island a little bit, right? We can just take a data set that doesn't exist and create something. But it also causes us to focus on what could be rather than everything that is saying what can't be. Um, so the time constraint, I, I'd say historically, you know, sometimes we, we spend way too long on a new topic where we knew, we knew what our final presentation was gonna be. We were working toward a deck, <laughs> slide deck. Um, if we would have gotten into something that, you know, they call it fail, fail quickly, but like why even fail? Just build um, and show that something is possible and then hand it to a line of business and say, now prove out whether or not we should do this. That's the way I'd love to go about it in the future, right? Um, that provides ample time for, for innovation and then also allow a line of business to say like, okay, yeah, based on what I know about a thing, right? So retail, um, this is something that we should do. Other questions, thoughts? Yeah, please. Yeah, okay, so how, how have we done innovation for attracting and growing talent? Um, this, this upcoming weekend is an interesting one. You know, it's, I know that as a bank, we need to find great talent earlier and earlier and earlier. Um, if I capture a, a student's attention when they're a senior, I've already lost them because you're gonna have three internships to compare them to. <laughs> and the idea that I'm gonna blow them away is, is unlikely. So how do we find folks earlier and earlier? Um, I've never been a huge fan of hackathons, right? As me personally. Um, but there's one that I really like and, and uh, we're doing it this weekend. Um, it's called Revolution UC, but it'll bring in 40, 40 schools, 300 plus students. And creating a charge for that is always fascinating. Um, you know, figuring out ways that we can partner with universities on classroom charges. There's always, I mean, there's just always one or two, probably more, probably more here. Uh, that stand out, that you're like, yeah, that one, go get that one, right? Um, and now we have places that we can send, you know, those students to recruiters, you just watch them, keep in touch with them, and things like this. I think one of the most interesting ones is, 
you know, we, we've always wanted to have great search in an app. And, and you hear that across startups and because it's like, we need the best search, top line search. We need to be able to search for anything. Well, as a user, there's nothing worse than like searching for something and it coming back with no results. And that's the thing. Um, what a bank actually needs is like good filtering, not good search, because you have transactions, you have things that exist. You know, we have ATM locations. You're not actually searching for it, you're just filtering what exists. Working with students to be able to figure that out is a great thing. What's, what's the best way that we can figure out how to take something that exists and show that back? Um, one thing that we're doing with students now is you know, when we talk about um, underserved uh, communities or, or um, types of individuals, um, retirees are one that I think are wildly underserved, especially from a banking perspective. Um, it's, you know, they go from earning a paycheck, um, having things taken out of their paycheck, to just like kind of having to deal with it. <laughs> and not everything is an equation anymore. That's a perfect, perfect thing for a student to, to understand in classwork, to get to know how a bank works, um, is to work on like very targeted ideas like that. Um, I'm having a, a user experience course tackle it from one end, and I'm having a, a master's level course tackle it from the other end on what are all the types of income a person can get so that it shows all the ways that the user experience breaks when I show it. Oh, what a, what a great learning experience for both sides, right? I gave you this, you thought you were awesome. I didn't ask you to take it from this side. Let's compare notes, that's super cool. Um, and we'll see who stands out. Any other, any other thoughts? I'm not sure where we are. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Monica Smith is joining us online. She asks, can you please speak to the diversity of thought and the benefit of explicitly acknowledging its role in innovation. Yeah. Um, it's the idea, so in, in user, I'm thinking about my user experience friends that, are, that I know are um, watching from up in Cincinnati. You know, we, we say it a lot where, um, you know, know the user, but by the way, you're not the user. <laughs> Even if we have someone largely studying them, themselves, it's important to have them look at a broader, a broader use case that really has no engagement with the topic itself. When we talk about, as I was talking about with you, so the Enneagram folks will get this, right, is I, I know that what motivates an individual to make the next best decision for themselves changes based on who you are. If I were to design an application just based on what I think is correct, I'm gonna design the perfect application for me. As we're working through ideative thought, and we have a brainstorm, we have seven people in the room. Like I said, three people are probably gonna be silent and two people are gonna control the conversation. One person's gonna scribe, probably, right? Um, in things like systematic inventive thinking, in things like you know whether you're determining your jobs to be done, break it down to two people, three people max. That'll give everyone a voice, which is great, but it allows people to actually build off each other conversationally rather than getting the exact opposite of diversity in thought, which is one person's thought, right? Break down your group numbers from five to seven to like two, and see what you get by playing the game that I showed you earlier with uh, smack a minute of thinking. All right, maybe we have time for one more. Yeah, please. Such a timely question. So the thought there was um, people need jobs and we have people with jobs and we're trying to innovate and that innovation could have consequences and that is um, no more need for those specific jobs, right? Um, I had an awesome opportunity to meet with our head of our central ops department. So they employ 4,000 individuals, um, high school degree upward, um, and this is your customer service. This is your problem resolution folks. And we were talking about the, the process um, methodology that I was talking about, right? The hotel example, because they're, they're a company of processes. And she was saying that when she was talking to employees, they thought that their existence, right, the value that they added was pointing out one or two fields that were always wrong. That's where they found their, their validation as a professional. And, she's, and so when it came to, hey, our processes could use, like we could use new processes here, that person became fearful that if we did that, they weren't gonna have a job. You're like, no, you understand. We could retrain you for much more important things. We need you to help us innovate and correct these problems because it's gonna make, it's, it's gonna make 
everything better for, for everyone and we have the things in place to retrain folks. We'd much rather have folks being relationship people, building those relationships, than having to manage that relationship on the back end because potentially something's gone wrong. Um, so they're, they're, they're absolutely uh, deterministic individuals at at least fifth third trying to show that you know a job is not a career for 30 or 40 years at fifth third. Um, I was hired in as a, as a designer. Right? I was hired in as a designer. Um, it's been a bottom up build you know, out, outside of that, but I'm not the only story where it's I came in to do one job and almost immediately started doing something else. So find a company, maybe, maybe, that's, maybe that's something to learn, right? Find a company that is willing to really understand who you are. Um, that's what makes Fifth Third great, right? I've seen countless folks move to other career opportunities because we'd much rather people stay. I hate it when my friends leave. <laughs> all right, thank you all very much. This means a lot once again that you all came. Um, appreciate it. Thank you very much, Nate, for those exciting and inspiring remarks. I think we can all come away from this thinking a couple of things. First of all, that uh, in this day and age, in any kind of business, it's not enough to be reactive or even adaptive. What we really need is proactive behavior, and we get to be innovative by getting outside of ourselves. We have to understand the other person's point of view, and we have to be empathetic to other people's ideas and desires. Thank you, Nate, for delivering that message. Thank you all for being here, either in person or online. More of these to come. MTSU, Jones College of Business, we try to be innovative ourselves. Thank you. <laughs>